who are buried even in Europe and have been lost at sea. We remember the fun times we've had, the things we've done, the faith we've shared. And at the same time, we're struck, struck with the power of death. It's unavoidable. Years ago, when I could still get a policy, the life insurance agent didn't ask if I was going to die. <laughs> Unless Christ returns first, I will, and so will you. Death has power, but our text reminds us that Christ is in the picture. He gives a power surge for this time and for eternity. We are delivered by his power and we welcome others to his power. It wasn't a particularly good time for the Apostle Paul. He'd come from the seacoast of Turkey, up through some high mountains, and he'd experienced very great eye trouble, ex exceedingly painful. Later, Paul wrote about that and said, I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. A doctor named Luke was along for the trip, but he couldn't help Paul either. Later, Paul reflected on the string of persecutions that he had suffered in southern Galatia. Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. As our text begins, Paul had left the area of, Ike I of Iconium and gone 35 miles to a very small town named Lystra. Lystra wasn't much. It was less than the size of downtown Stevensville. But it was on an important road. That is the Via Sebast with a picture taken 2,000 years later. Yes, some dirt blew over the road and some grass is growing on it, but you can see the difference in color of the grass there and the grass in the field. At 2,000 years old, it's still a smooth road. It was an I-94 of Bible times. The town was surrounded by fields where crops were raised to feed the travelers who passed through. And Lystra would understand Stevensville or Baroda or Berrien Springs very well. <laughs> uh, the reality is that it was full of motels. Stevensville has six major ones. When Paul got to Lystra, though, he began to preach in Greek. He was very fluent in it, but it was a language that not everybody was fluent in, especially the people who worked in the fields or worked at the motels. The reality of the matter was that their native language was like Aeonian, and they tended to be more comfortable in that language. Dr. Luke describes what Paul encountered as he was first preaching in, Lyst in Lystra. He encountered a man who had been lame from birth. And that man who had been lame from birth hadn't wasted his time. He was crippled. The doctor, Luke, calls him an impossible case, a dinatos. But the crippled man apparently had used his time well to, to learn Greek much better than the people around him. As Paul preached in Greek about sin, salvation, and the resurrection, the crippled man came to believe in Christ and even to believe that the ascended Jesus could heal him. With the coming of faith, his face lit up. He could hardly contain his joy. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. The power was obvious. <laughs> Dr. Luke realized that he'd called it an impossible case. Even if Dr. Luke had been able to perform surgery to uh, 
revise the structures of his legs. It would have taken months of rehab before the man could walk. But immediately, without pause, the man jumps up. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lycaonian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because the, he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. Yeah, I'm sure you're familiar with people who switch languages in a moment of excitement. I've heard it happen in German around here. Personally, I sometimes switch to Spanish without thinking. When did it about two months ago in New Alm, and the person turned to me and said, Dave, I'm Chinese, not Mexican. <laughs> oh, well. But we get a real linguistic mess here. Ah, yes. They come with bulls adorned with wreaths, ready to order, offer sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas. With a language barrier, what could the guys do? Well, they had an idea. You see, in the ancient world, every thread was spun by hand. Every garment was woven thread by hand. Thread by hand. And so the greatest expression of grief in the ancient world was to rip your clothing. When the apostles Paul and Barnabas heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, shouting, Men, why are you doing this? We are only men, human like you. Ripping a $10,000 garment caught their attention. It showed the vast distress of these apostles. It was what the high priest did when Jesus, on trial, claimed that he is God. Here at Lystra, with the ripped clothing, the people began to wonder, what on earth is wrong? And they began to listen very carefully to Paul's Greek. He began with a basic truth. God created all people to serve him. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. Then year after year, God had blessed them just as he blesses and preserves us. Paul continued, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown you kindness by giving rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Yes, like the people of Lystra, we have experienced the wonders, the mercies of God. They didn't bother with closets in Lystra. They just had one outfit. <laughs> Our closets are embarrassingly full. They walked from town to town because that's the way you did it. We're blessed with cars, even airplanes. Ah, yes. And yet, even with those words, we read, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. But it wasn't long before another problem arose. Paul and Barnabas were only 35 miles away from the last city they had been driven out of. Trouble soon began to catch up with them. In a matter of days, Paul went from being called a god to being called a blasphemer. Someone who claims to be God and is not. Someone who speaks against the Almighty. We read, Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. They couldn't detect respirations. They couldn't feel a pulse. Surely he's dead. And they dragged him out and left him outside the city. They 
didn't want him decaying inside the city walls. In our day, Paul would have been put in intensive care. But our Lord performed a third miracle in Lystra. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. Well, that's nice, you say. But what does it mean for me? I called the healing of Paul after he'd been stoned the third miracle. The healing of the cripple was the second. What was the first one? It was the changed heart in that man who had been crippled all his life. That first miracle was the faith the Holy Spirit worked in the crippled man. And God has worked that same miracle in your hearts. He began it in baptism. He's continued it as we hear his word here. The Spirit strengthens us through the preaching of the word, just as he did at Lystra. Miracles are performed in hearts today, too, as we hear his word and grow in faith. You are not the bitter, cynical, angry person you might have been if God had not changed your heart. We love one another because Christ has first loved us. But how would those first miracles, the most important ones, continue in Lystra? Paul was there just a few days and was driven out of town. But people were left behind, just as we have been left behind at Stevensville. We have been delivered by his power, but then we welcome others to his power. We just need to turn two chapters to Acts chapter 16, and we find something fascinating. Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived whose mother was a Jewess and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Timothy doesn't seem to have been in the small town two years earlier. He didn't see the lame man healed or Paul brought back from near death. Perhaps he moved there after Paul had left. It was a strange kind of situation. Timothy was a half-breed. His mother was Jewish, as was his grandmother. But his father was a Greek. He wasn't welcomed by Jews or Greeks. But, but the layman had been doing his work. A congregation had formed. No, they were two years without a pastor. But that doesn't mean that the preaching of God's word stopped. And when Timothy and his mother came, they were welcomed. Half-breed or not, who cares? He's a soul, one Christ died for. They welcomed Timothy and found out that he knew about the Old Testament. He knew about the miracles in the Exodus. He knew many things, but he didn't know about Jesus. And the lame man and others welcomed him and taught him. Timothy's welcome at Lystra was an eternally important event. And it simply began with welcoming a new family into town. Then it continued with friendship and instruction. And it went from there to Timothy being the Apostle Paul's understudy, if you will, assistant who spread the word to Europe, to the world, to you and me. God still wants to work that way today. Lystra is a lot like Stevensville, a small town on a big highway. But the people of Lystra didn't say, oh, we're so small, we can't do anything. 
No, they didn't miss any opportunity to reach out, be it to a resident of the town or a traveler passing through. They welcomed strangers. They welcomed newcomers. And we need more of that here. I hear lots of Spanish spoken in town, but none here at church. Last week I helped a family move. It was interesting. He is a very well-paid executive whom Whirlpool transferred back here. But he's black and his wife is white, and they had a great deal of difficulty finding a place to live. They had to put their stuff in storage for over a month. I was able to help him move. But a lot more than that, I was able to share the message of Christ with him, just as the people of Lystra did so many years ago. We pray that that will bear fruit. They know the sure hope we have here. Six weeks ago, we had Easter for kids. And you worked very hard at that, many of you. We got a list of about 250 names of people who were willing to enter the church, willing to see us. But it takes more than having the name. That list needs to be followed up on. We could greet those people, invite them to worship services. Virtually all of them were families with children. We could invite the children to Sunday school or Christian day school. You could call on some of those people. As you realize, Pastor Keeler is pretty well overwhelmed at the moment. I'm only working half time. You could befriend the new people and care about them. Lystra didn't have a pastor, but some layperson made Timothy and his family welcome. What an eternal difference that made. What about your neighborhood? Is there someone in your neighborhood who is sick? Perhaps has heard the big C word? Someone in your neighborhood who's troubled? perhaps with a rebellious child. You can share her the hope you have. You can share the peace you've found in Christ. You can be like the people of Lystra, who welcomed Timothy and his mother and grandmother. Forget that they're half-breeds. They have souls for whom Christ died. You can be, go to a neighbor who is sick or without a job. God is waiting for you. He's waiting to use you to bring his love, his care, his forgiveness to others. Amen.